Senator Sally Otto. So he's going to be telling us today about sexual selection and species coexistence. It's going to be a theory talk. Yep. So uh, prepare yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, as Jim said, this is work I did uh, at UBC um, with Sally Otto uh, during my PhD. So one question I think that most biologists are uh, motivated or interested in is explaining where diversity comes from. There's a huge amount of diversity in the world around us and we want to at least attempt to understand its origins. And I think that most biologists would also agree that sexual selection is, is an important process in uh, maintaining or, or generating this biodiversity so, somehow. Uh, here's a collection of species that are clearly very dramatically characterized by their sexual ornamentation. So you, you have a frog bird with its huge balloon that it uses to court females. I think that it's pretty, it'd be pretty um, hard to, to say that these species are not affected by the, the processes of sexual selection and, and mate choice. And um, it, it is sort of an open question how much these mating traits have to do with the origin and maintenance of these species. One interesting observation is that uh, many, and, and kind of backing up that assertion that sexual selection is likely an important process in, in maintaining or generating species diversity, is the observation that there's a number of species that tend to differ most, almost exclusively, in, in mating traits. So here are two ground crickets that as far as, as anyone can tell are ecologically almost identical. These things are <coughs> living in the same place, they're eating the same resources, they're doing the same thing. And the main differences between them are the preferences of the females towards the different males. So the males court with slightly different songs and then that attracts the females. And so this is, a, I think, a, these, and there's lots of examples like this. I think, I think these are, are good examples that would seem to suggest that sexual differences in species, so the differences in mating preferences or courtship behaviors, are an important process in, in maintaining or generating species because we have these examples that, of things that differ almost exclusively in traits that are, are sexually selected. There's been a lot of theoretical work looking at this. It's a pretty, historically it's been a pretty sort of sexy topic. Uh, and there's a, so there's a number of models that have, have shown that sexual selection can can lead to the, the origin of, of different mating groups or, or species that are sort of reproductively isolated through sexual uh, preferences. So here's an example by uh, Turner and Burroughs in 1995, where they start off with uh, a, a monomorphic population, and they show that uh, this um, group of uh, a sort of separate species can emerge where they, they a dark species that prefers dark and can emerge out of a light species that prefers light. Uh, and here's a classic one by uh, Higashi et al. in 1999, that was published in Nature, where they, they start off with a monomorphic population and they show that you can have, have this Fisherian runaway process where you get these, these different types emerging and then they're, they're reflectively isolated. And just to sort of show you how these models generally work, I'll, I'll, I'll use a cartoon to illustrate a, a Fisherian runaway process. And I, throughout my talk, I'm going to use these little cartoon frogs, and I, I use the eye color to kind of denote their preference. So here we have uh, a population of green frogs, and we have this one, which we could imagine as a female, and she has a yellow eyes to indicate that she prefers brighter males. And so here, if, if she has this preference for brighter males, she might choose this individual to mate with. And then what you end up with in the next generation is you have maybe more brighter males. But the key thing is that you end up with brighter males, and in addition, the, the brighter individuals tend to have inherited from their mother the preference for the bright traits. So you have this linkage disequilibrium builds up between the, the bright display trait and the preference for bright. And what that does is that actually creates right away an intrinsic benefit to being bright, because now suddenly we have a bunch of individuals who prefer bright males, and then we have uh, bright males themselves. So you, you end up with this kind of feedback process. So here, the, the bright individual might pick the brightest one, and, and you kind of end up with this, this runaway process where the, the bright female selects for brighter, and it, it kind of goes on. And you can imagine that if you started with two different populations, you might have one population that prefers yellow and runs away to this yellow population, another population that prefers red, runs away to prefer red. And then when they come back in contact, you might end up with these you know, two different reproductively isolated groups. So that's kind of what's going on in this, this model of, of Gashi and a number of, of these models of sexual selection. <coughs> 
you start off with a monomer population of these runaway processes that generate different types, and then they are uh, <coughs> reflexively isolated. So the, the problem with sexual selection as a, a mechanism for maintaining species is that it does not lead on its own to ecological diversification or differentiation. So there's nothing different between these yellow and red frogs. If the main thing that has, has evolved is preferences for like types, they, they are still going to be eating the same thing and largely doing the same thing. And the reason this is a problem is if you had a population that was contained two different species, yellow ones and red ones, and they're uh, hanging out in the same area and eating the same thing, well, just by chance, as time goes by, you might end up with fluctuations in the frequency of the red individuals to the point where by chance, you end up with many more red individuals than yellow individuals, because there's nothing kind of maintaining the two types. And then once you have enough of one type, you actually would end up, under most models of sexual selection, with, with frequency-dependent selection against the rare type, because suddenly, if this is a yellow male, and he's surrounded by females that prefer yellow, or prefer red, he's not going to get any matings, and so you actually would end up with the loss of the rare type when it becomes rare. But in general, the, it's this idea that there's nothing maintaining the two types ecologically, then they just drift in, in time and one should go extinct. So what a lot of people have done is they have paired sexual selection with natural selection. And so what they, people have seen, Russ Landy's classic papers, have got these two different types and they eat different things. So yellow frogs eat yellow flies and red frogs eat red flies. And, and then what they show that, what he's shown and a number of people have shown is that then you end up with stable, stable species coexistence through time. You can end up, here's a, an example of these dashed lines represent different natural selection, naturally selected environments, sort of ecological types, and, and when you add sexual selection, you kind of amplify the signal of natural selection, but the, the key thing is, um, well, yeah, so you can, you can end up with long-term coexistence. The problem is, though, that these models have really created the impression that sexual selection as a process for maintaining different species is really only important when it's paired with natural selection. It's sort of a, an amplifier of natural selection, or it's, it's kind of a, a backseat role. It can't really work just on its own. And so in order to properly assess, I think, the, the role of sexual selection, we need to consider models that are ecologically neutral. So we want to consider models that look at sexual selection and species coexistence, but where there's no natural selection. There's no ecological differentiation between things. There's no different resources. It's all ecologically neutral. And there is one such model that was uh, written by uh, Payne and Cracker in 1997, published in Evolution. <laughs> and what they suggested was, if we go back to that scenario, you have these, these two different types, yellow and red. If you have male movement depend on, on the, their sort of mating prospects, they argued this could stabilize species through time. So here you have a red individual, if it's a male, surrounded by yellow individuals, its mating prospects aren't very good because if the females around it doesn't, don't like it. So if you end up with movement, these, in, these individuals move more, more rapidly, then you can end up with the segregation of the different types in space. So they argued, well, so here, here's a, an example from, figure from their paper. You've got this sort of uh, little jagged line as the initial population, and then you end up with these sort of segregating out of the red type, yellow type, red type. What they argued was this can stabilize species coexistence over evolutionary time scales. But there's the same problem as I showed before, actually comes in in this model. So here we have uh, the boundary between the yellow and the red type, or we can see here we've got this yellow, red type and the yellow type, but there's nothing that's holding this boundary in, in place. So it might be that through time the red type shifts in one direction and wipes out the yellow type just through that. So it's actually not a model of long-term coexistence, as they argue that it was. So um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to develop a model that, like they did, in an ecologically neutral environment and look at whether we could find conditions where sexual selection on its own can maintain uh, species, different species. And the thing that we looked at in, in particular we wanted to consider is, is what about variation in resource abundance? So we considered an environment where there's resources available to individuals, but they're not distributed uniformly across space. There's no differences in the resource, it could, it could be just any particular thing that the, that the animals or, or organisms require, and it's just that there's more here than there is here, and there's more here again. But it's all the same resources. It's not yellow and red flies, for example. So then the idea behind our model is uh, you end up with, or, or I guess as a consequence of this 
variation resource, you end up with variation in the density of individuals as you move across space. You have lots here where there's high resources, not very many here where there's low resources. And the basic, just the basic genetics of our model to give you a bit of background, we had a, a two locus model where we have a, a display allele and a preference allele. So here's an example of an individual with this genotype. It's got a red display trait and a yellow preference. And the, the way it works is a female with a preference for yellow would prefer yellow males over red males, for example. Um, and vice versa, red preferring females for red males. So the idea then in our model was, well, we start off with this population that's say randomly distributed. You've got these, these high density of individuals where these high resource peaks are. And like I showed you before, these rare individuals are going to be at a fitness disadvantage because the females wouldn't prefer them. Say. So you end up with sort of local fixation of one type at one resource peak. By chance, it could be the other type at the other resource peak. And maybe these variation in resources might stabilize the movement of this interface between them. So it's a fairly simple idea. So we, we put this together into an individual-based model. And we uh, considered, so here I'll just show you a couple of sample simulations. We've got, uh, here's a, an example of a homogeneous resource distribution and a heterogeneous resource distribution. So we've got the two sort of peaks of resources. But I should emphasize there's no differences in any of the resources. If we look at it in a homogeneous environment, you start off with the sort of uniform distribution of individuals. And as uh, right away, you end up with these, this quick formation of these uh, mating types, these mating domains, we call them. And if you run it for long enough, what happens is, is this is after a thousand generations, one of the types takes over, and as you'd expect by this kind of drift of the boundary between them. But then if we run the exact same simulation in the environment where the resources are distributed non-uniformly, what ends up happening is, again, you end up with these quick formation of these different mating domains. But after a 1,000 generations, you see that they're still held in place quite nicely at about 50-50 by these resource peaks. And I should emphasize here that this is a totally stochastic process. So it could be that if you reran this, yellow would take over both peaks, and then red would go extinct. It could be red takes over both peaks. At this point, if I took all the red ones and put them here, and all the yellow ones and put them here, they would. Th there's no difference between yellow and red on these peaks. Um, and it's, so sometimes you'd lose one type, or, and, and sometimes you wouldn't. So I think this is this, what we showed here is that, that it, actually something as simple as resource variation can, can stabilize the species. Um, the, so one thing that, I, that I've t talked about already is that the fitness of rare males in this in this model is lower because females don't prefer them. But I actually, I haven't told you the whole story here, so I, I'll go into it a bit more detail here. Uh, so in the, if this is a rare male, like I, like I showed you, this, this individual would have low fitness because he's surrounded by individuals who all prefer red. They all have the red preference allele. So you end up with the, this individual being selected out, out of the, or having a low fitness, and you end up with the sort of purifying effect within this, this mating domain. But uh, in order to prevent mixing of these two different mating domains, you actually need to have uh, fitness cost in both sexes. You, you can't, and, and I'll, I'll show you why that is here. This is the second part of the story that I didn't really show you before. Uh, if we have, imagine a, a scenario here, we've got our, our two different yellow and red populations on these different resource peaks. By chance, uh, a preference for red might drift into this population of yellow. And now if there's no selection against this, if this is a female, if there's no selection against her for preferring red, then by chance, the red preference allele might spread to high frequency. Because there's no selection against it if it's neutral, the red preference allele might drift to high frequency. But now what we have is we have a situation where suddenly a red display allele in males would actually be favored in this population. So if we look at this male, this male is going to be more attractive to all these females than the, the males surrounding her. So red should be selected to kind of invade that population. And so if you don't have, so, so this, is, um, this is how, wh why you need the, the selection against both rare males and rare females in, in order for this to work. So, so like I, I just said, you need, you need selection against both sexes. And so this is actually really common in, in models of sexual selection and actually motivated by more by empirical work, the idea that rare females suffer a fitness cost uh, is, is 
uh, pretty much ubiquitous now in models of sexual selection. And, and the reason is if you can imagine that a, a female is surrounded by males she doesn't like, she might have to spend a longer amount of time looking for the, the perfect mate, at which point she uses more resources and has less to provision her offspring with, or she might have a higher risk of getting beaten by a predator in that, amount, that time that she's looking for a mate. So the, the idea that a, a rare female, or a female that is, prefers a locally rare trait suffers a fitness cost, I think, is, is actually quite, quite common. So in, in our model, this female, because she has a preference for yellow, is surrounded by males displaying red, would, would suffer a, a reduced fitness. So going back to the, show you a kind of more general figure here. This is a figure where we're showing on the x-axis the strength of, of preference costs in females, so the strength of, of selection against those females surrounded by locally rare or, or types she doesn't like, and the amount of, of variation on the y-axis. And what you can see here is that, um, well, I'll go, actually I'll go through a few different cases here. So if we imagine, here's a model with, with zero variation, just to show you, this is the, these, these little inset panels here show how much variation there is in the resources you move up through the y direction and, and the cost increases you move left to right. So we start off down here and we look at uh, a point where there's no search costs in females and there's no variation in resources. And we run a bunch of simulations like I showed you before and we plot the frequency of say the red type. It sort of moves around by drift but quite quickly either goes extinct or fixes. Sometimes yellow fixes, sometimes red fixes. So you run, it looks like that. And if you did that a whole bunch of times you could generate this nice little sort of frequency distribution and shows that uh, quite quickly within usually 50 or 100 generations you lose one of the two types. Now if we do the, we look at the exact same plot but in an environment where there's variation in the resources but still there's no search costs in females, you see that things look exactly the same. So just adding this variation in resource abundance doesn't actually change the story at all. Similarly, if you add just search costs in females, so just the cost to being, to, to being a rare, a female preferring a rare trait you, you see a very similar pattern again. And here, the, the persistence times are a little bit longer, and that's just because with a, with a cost to rare females, you, you end up with this kind of purifying force within groups, and, and it ends up helping the, the two species a little bit, but really within 100 or 200 generations, you lose one or the other type. And when you add both, a, you consider a variation resource abundance and cost to being rare, you end up with the two types persisting at roughly equal frequency for a super long time. I mean, as long as you can run your computer, really. So what we're showing here is really neither of these conditions are sufficient on their own to maintain the two types, but when you have them both, you get quite long-term species coexistence. And one thing, too, to, I think to point out here is that if we actually look at the amount of variation we're talking about, on the, which is shown on the y-axis here, in a lot of cases, with strong costs to being rare, it's, it's less than 20%. So we're talking about variation in resources that is really a, a, a small amount. I would argue if you went out into the field and you wanted to try and measure some re critical resource for a species and, and it was varying at you know, 15 or 20%, that would be very difficult to, to detect empirically. We're not, so we're not talking about things on you know, mountaintops separated by a valley, but things that are really inhabiting something where the, the variation in resources can be quite slight. And also, uh, just showing you the, the costs of, of selection against rare females, this is, this is just showing you the females for that simulation I showed you before, and then this is plotting their fitness as, uh, in terms of mate search costs. So uh, on the, the higher the points here, the higher the cost experienced by those females. So what you can see here is for the individuals that are occupying this, this middle region, they pay a, a higher search cost and the individuals in the pure regions. But this is for the most extreme parameters I showed you, and what you can see is, you know, even in the worst case scenario, the, the worst, the females surrounded by the males they like the least suffer a fitness cost of about 50% relative to the other females. So, I mean, that's a high fitness cost, but we're not talking about, about massive fitness costs, because this really is the most extreme case that, for what I showed you in the previous picture. So, both cases, the amount of variation needed and the costs against rare females are, are not you know, outrageously large. And um, actually, one, one interesting observation is that competition is actually weakest, kind of counterintuitively, in this middle region where the resources are least abundant. And the, the reason for that is the females in this region have the lowest 
uh, the highest mate search costs. So they actually have the lowest fitness when they reproduce, as you can see here. The, this is the mate search cost. So they have a reduced fitness, which means they produce proportionally fewer offspring relative to the individuals in the high resource distribution, or high, high, high resource area. So there are actually fewer individuals in this region than you'd expect based on just the amount of resources that are there relative to this region. So these individuals in the, in the next generation, because their mothers have low fitness, they actually experience less competition. So the ecological fitness is actually highest in this low density region. So when you actually combine the fitness, your total fitness through the mate search costs and your, your amount of resources you acquire from the environment, you get almost a flat line. Really, the, the, fitness, the fitness is actually not varying very much as you move through uh, across space. And, and what that, I think, is showing is that the effect of this variation in resources is not to create this red population and this yellow population that are just producing tons of red and yellow individuals in the middle. What it's really doing is stopping this boundary between the reds and the yellows from moving around. And so it's maintaining them that way. And one, one thing I should say is, is this is actually not just a model of sexual selection. I've, we, we've sort of pitched it as a model of sexual selection, but really all you need is, uh, um, is sexual or frequency dependent selection against rare types. So if you had uh, any process that generates frequency dependent selection against, say, red individuals in a population of yellow, should, should work just fine in this model. And um, I'm just going to show you uh, an example here. W one, one common process that one thing that generates frequency dependent selection against rare types is selection against hybrids as another example. So this is not, not sexual selection. And so here, just to sort of show you what I mean here, if we had um, a population of yellow and red individuals, and, and here we say have a quantitative model where if red mates with yellow, they produce in the next generation, uh, the offspring from these guys produces this intermediate orange individual. Well, if there's selection against hybrids, and that orange individual has a, because there's selection against hybrids, has a lower fitness, it might be that it can't get resources very well or it's more conspicuous to, to predators. Well, then if we go back and we look at this population, out of the, this offspring represented 100% of the offspring produced by this red individual. But it only represented a small fraction of the offspring produced by the yellow individuals. So selection against this hybrid actually has a, a much larger fitness consequence for the red individual than it does across all the yellow individuals. And so, so selection against hybrids also creates a, a selection against rare types within a population. So we could take the story I just told you about sexual selection, we could change it and say, now we're going to consider a quantitative model where there's hybridization and selection against hybrids, and that should work just fine instead of sexual selection. So we chose to talk about sexual selection, but I think it's a much more general model, really. The key is that you have frequency-dependent selection against rare types. So we considered a um, few extensions to this, to this model. One of them is we actually considered a, a quantitative model, not like I just showed you with selection against hybrids, but a, a quantitative model of, of sexual selection. So we have red and yellow, and when they mate, they, they form an orange offspring. And again, because the, the previous one I showed you is a fairly simple model with uh, two Two, two loci, two alleles at each locus. So in a quantitative model, you, you can imagine you have many loci underlying these traits, and it works just fine. As long as the females, as long as the individuals prefer their own type sort of sufficiently strongly compared to the other type, then you end up with the maintenance of the red and yellow, and these orange individuals sort of never really can take off. And then, of course, the more not, the sort of more important extension, I think, is we, we generalize this out to more realistic-looking landscapes. So here's a sort of stochastically generated heterogeneous environment instead of these perfect Gaussian peaks of resources. And, and what we found there is, again, you, you end up with long-term coexistence, and you can see the different types colonize the different peaks, just like in the previous one. But here, it's obviously much <coughs> noisier looking. And actually, we, we also went out and, and considered more, more than two types. So you could have uh, blue prefers blue, red prefers red, and you could end up with all these different types sort of colonizing their different peaks. So the next question, then, is, sort of empirical evidence for this, you know, is, is, is this really a, a relevant thing you're comparing to? And <coughs> I, I haven't, I'm not an empirical biologist by training, and I haven't had time to look into the empirical literature, but it does seem like there's some really good candidates for, for this model 
uh, things things that would would be good candidates for for coexisting via these mechanisms in in sympatry. So here you can imagine just looking at the at the cichlids in Lake Victoria, we have these you know thousands of cichlid species occupying the same lake, and as far as we can tell, many of these species pairs differ most dramatically in their their colors and the opsins and so the colors the females per, um, prefer. So you know, it would be really interesting to go and, and, and look at Lake Victoria. I mean, now it's a fairly disturbed environment, but you know, possibly you, we might be able to identify that you know you have different sexual sexually selected species that are separated by maybe poor habitat, and and that could explain how they how they're coexisting. And the, the actually the best example I think are are the damselflies that Mark McPeak studies. Here we have the there's literally tons of these species of damselflies that are ecologically totally the same. And the, the main thing that differentiates them is the, is the claspers the male used to hold the female during copulation and the corresponding structure in the female that the male clasps onto. So males from different species can't grip females from other species when they're copulating. And so you have really just these, these, sort, of these sort of physical traits that are, are uh, um, related to sexual selection that are, seem to be the main differentiating characters. And these things, we're, we're talking about lakes that you have one damselfly species in one lake, and in the next door lake you have a different damselfly species filling the same ecological niche, but with a different mating mechanism. So the, I think the main conclusions from, from this part of my talk are that when you combine variation in local resource abundance with mate search costs, you can get long-term coexistence of species in the absence of any ecological differentiation. The only thing differentiating them is their the sexual preferences. And I think also it's sort of worth emphasizing this point that surprisingly little variation in resource abundance is maybe sufficient to, to get this coexistence. So po possibly a difficult thing to measure in nature, actually, to levels of variation that are so slight that it would be hard to go out and, and see if you could actually find them. So next I want to talk about some other work I did uh, with <coughs> at UBC as well that um, I actually did before the, the this model of sexual selection, but I think it, it follows more naturally afterwards. And this was a, a sort of application of these ideas to hybrid zones, which are a, a big area of interest in, well, at UBC anyway. So a hybrid zone, so there's this sort of long-standing um, argument from Nick Barton and, and some, some of the classic hybrid zone papers that hybrid zones tend to match up best with low density areas. So what Nick Barton argued was that if you have a hybrid zone between two species, it should actually move around in space until it reaches a, a low density area like a cliff or a river or something. And there's not a lot of empirical evidence for this, but there are some, some good examples of species where if you, you find the hybrid zone, it is in actually an area that's pretty much uninhabitable by others, either species. And so the reason this is, this is sort of relevant is that when we look at these species distributions we generated here, you can see that same thing. You've got the low density region uh, is the boundary between the, the two the different species types. So one thing that the most common thing people do when they want to measure spatial structure in hybrid zones is they go out and they, they here's a hybrid zone, say, between different frogs. They lay down a transect and measure the frequency of of, a, of allele that is characteristic of one species as they, as they move through the, the hybrid zone. So you measure the frequency of yellow as you at each of these points through the hybrid zone. And the kind of conventional <coughs> thought, and, and what Nick Barton has shown a ton of cool stuff about, is that as you move through the hybrid zone, you get this nice smooth sort of clinal transition from, say, yellow to red, as you might expect. <coughs> but there's a, a large number of hybrid zones that don't fit this pattern. And these are, these are called mosaic hybrid zones. And what you see there is as you go through the hybrid zone, you go from one species to a basically a pure population of the other species, and then back to the first species, and so on. And you get this kind of back and forth pattern. And so it's this kind of mosaic pattern. So this is the hybrid zone between these um, two mussel species along the southern coast of France. So, and I should also say here that the, it's really difficult to evaluate actually the sort of relative frequency of these two different types of hybrid zones because 
the spatial scale at which you sample matters a lot. If you have a, here you might sample this hybrid zone at a very coarse scale and see this nice clinal pattern as you'd expect. If you then went back to that same hybrid zone and resampled it at a much finer scale, you might actually see that, well, at the finer scale, it's, it's a mosaic of pure patches. But by sampling at the coarse scale, because you kind of bin these different patches of species A and species B, you get these intermediate allele frequencies, you kind of miss that pattern by, by sampling at too coarse of a scale. So it, I, you know, it, it's possible that the prevalence of mosaic hybrid zones is actually much greater than we think based on the sort of literature that's out there. So the question, though, that I'm interested in and in relation to se sexual selection is, well, what, what causes mosaic hybrid zones? And the traditional explanation is that you have two different species of frogs, say, yellow and red, and they're adapted to different pond types. Yellow frogs prefer silty ponds, and red frogs prefer clear ponds. And the hybrid zone is a kind of patchwork of clear ponds and silty ponds, because it's the intermediate region of the two species ranges. So the species sort of preferentially segregate into their preferred habitat types, and as a result, they exhibit these mosaic patterns only because the underlying habitat is, is this mosaic pattern. The problem is that when you go out again and you, and you try and identify the ecological correlates that, that explain the mosaic pattern, often it's very, very difficult to, to do so. In those crickets I showed you at the beginning, they, they are a great case of something that has a very mosaic hybrid zone, but when you look at the ecological correlates underlying that spatial distribution, it, it explains you know, one or two percent of the variation in the species distribution. So really, we haven't got any idea what ecological differences there are between the different population patches. So I started thinking about sort of maybe what intrinsic characteristics of the species themselves might lead <laughs> to these mosaic patterns. And in particular, female choosiness and, and the sort of sexual selection. Because you can see that uh, like I, I showed you in the previous model, when you get these variation in resource abundance, it, you get this nice pure patches of the two different types being sort of held in place by these high density of resources. So what we did is we, we wrote some simulations and we looked at the, the mosaic or the transect through the hybrid zone in our simulations when we ran it with and without choosy females. So here are our two sample. Simulations, and so here's an example of a hybrid zone in our model where you have no choosiness in females, so females made randomly, you get this nice climb just like you'd expect. But when you run it with, with choosy females, you end up with these really pure patches of the two types and this nice mosaic pattern. And it's exactly the same reason as before. Uh, here you have, you know, this might be a patch of yellow individuals. Any red male that moves in there is going to be selected against because the females don't like that male. So in order to actually show this a little more, we had to, to actually quantify the difference between these two different things. We had to develop a, a little statistic that we could fit through our hybrid zones, and we called this mosaicity. <laughs> and basically what we did is we fit this stepwise model through the hybrid zone, and then we summed up all the down steps of the model. So if we look at this one, it's a little easier to see. If you sum up all the down steps, you get roughly five reversals in allele frequency. So you get a score of about five. So it kind of tells you, you know, how many times did you switch from one population back to the original population. And if you look at a, this population, it's a score of, in, in theory, if it was a perfect decline, it would be zero, but it's a little higher than zero because there's a bit of noise. So um, the next thing we looked at was, was uh, how the, the model of female preference. And we looked at the, and we showed that the, the how females choose their mates actually matters quite a lot in terms of the spatial structure that persists. So the, one of the, the classic models of sexual selection is the, the best of n, as uh, John Seeger introduced it. And, and this is where a, a female surveys n males and, and then uh, chooses one to mate out of the n that she, she sought, the one she likes the most. So if n is 1, that means a female looks at one male and then mates with that male. So it's totally random mating. So if we look here is the, the strength of, of female preference, so this, how, how strongly females prefer conspecifics, and that mosaicity score that I showed you before. So with random mating, there's no change as females become choosier. And just as you can see, if, if this is a female, she chooses one male. It could be a red male, it could be a yellow male, so it's totally random. But then if we, if we consider the same thing with now a female choosing, choosing five males, uh, what happens is as soon as you have preference, you get much higher 
mosaic, mosaic scores for your hybrid zones. And, and that's because when females start surveying more males, they're, they're finding their preferred males and mating with those males, and so that creates frequency dependent selection against rare types. Interestingly, when, when females choose, and, and I mean, this is maybe not a biologically super realistic parameter space that we're in, but when females choose a lot of males, and they're very, very choosy, the mosaic score actually decreases again for the, the most sort of extreme preference. And the reason for that is if you actually imagine here, you have a population, and this is a, a female, and there, there's a rare female and a rare male, and she chooses a lot of males to look at before she actually picks her <coughs> preferred male, so she's going to look at, say, five here, which is quite a lot in this population. A lot of the time, she's going to see that male, that, that rare male of her own type. And so she's going to choose this male. And what then happens is you end up with the yellow type, because they're so, they, they look at so many males before they choose a mate, and they're so choosy, they can kind of coexist within the red population without really being strongly selected against. So there's actually less frequency dependent selection when females choose many males and when they're very choosy. So that's kind of why you get this downtrend again. And the last thing we did here was we uh, took this statistic that we had developed and we fit it to uh, some empirical hybrid zone data from that muscle example I showed you at the beginning. And we estimated the mosaic scores. So here was, here's the raw hybrid zone. And we fit our stepwise model to three different loci. And what we found is actually the um, mosaic score for, for all three of them were fairly mosaic. And actually, this one locus was significantly more mosaic than the, than the other two loci. And so that would be consistent with this locus being something that is involved in assortative mating, as I, as based on our, our, our model. So it could be that this is a locus involved in female preference or male display traits. But just like I, I <coughs> talked about in the first model about selection against hybrids, it's the same thing here. This could be a locus that is involved in selection against hybrids, which is, which is quite common in these hybrid zones. Because uh, for the same reasons as, as in the, the model of in the sort of variable resource environments, selection against hybrids creates frequency dependent selection against rare types. So it can also maintain mosaic hybrid zones in the same way that uh, sexual selection can. So just to wrap up here, I think the main conclusion from, from this is that assortative mating and, and female choosiness or selection against hybrids can actually be used as a, as a possible explanation for, for these mosaic hybrid zones in cases where, where we don't know what the ecological trait is, if there may be no ecological trait. And I, and I should say here that I'm not saying that mosaic hybrid zones are a result of sexual selection or, or uh, selection against hybrids, but more that this is a sort of possible thing that we could also consider. Of course, if, if you have some ecological trait, then you know, the two things can work perfectly well together. You have things segregating in space because uh, there's ecological differences and, and their, their distribution is sort of representing that e ecological differences. But then if you have sexual selection or selection against hybrids, you can have this kind of even more amplification of that pure, these pure populations of these, these mosaic distributions. So, but but I think this this is at least in the um, mosaic in the hybrid zone literature. This is sort of a, a new uh, mechanism that for possibly maintaining species diversity in hybrid zones. And then I think the the main conclusion from from my talk in general is that I don't think sexual selection should be discounted as a as a possibly important process maintaining species diversity. And I think that the current sort of state of mind in evolutionary biologists is that sexual selection is undoubtedly an important process in um, maintaining species to some extent when you combine it with natural selection. But I think what, 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 we're, what I'm saying here is that it, it possibly could be a kind of driver seat role. It could actually be, in many cases, the, the sort of primary thing maintaining, maintaining species differences. And, and I should say again here, um, of course, this is not mutually exclusive from, from ecological differences. If you have ecological differences, like Russ Landy and many others have shown, sexual selection can really help. Um, but I, I think more of the thing is here is, is you know, wh which one is the, is the primary um, mechanism maintaining the, the different species. So with that, I'd like to thank my 
co-authors um, on, on, on both projects, and um, really especially my supervisor, Sally Otto, who is an absolutely wonderful person to work with and helped me through the many years that it took to get through these projects. And thank you all for coming. So we have plenty of time for questions for later. Yep. So as far as I can tell, all these models assume that whatever the resource is, <coughs> sorry, is static through time. But what happens if you have a resource that is varying across the landscape, or let's say it's a biological resource that's actually coupled to the species, so you have some kind of lot couple tariff dynamic that comes and, in? So that's a, a great question, and I think that um, if you have something like that, then I would say over the long term you'll eventually lose the species diversity because if you have peaks kind of popping up and, and disappearing, then um, you'd end up with the, the problem is that there's no mechanism in these models for a rare type to invade invade a population. So if, if a yellow peak disappears and gets taken over by red, there's no way that that yellow can come back in. And so that's one thing I should I actually brings up, a, I think, a much bigger point, which is that this is, so this is not at all, a, a, I, none of this is about speciation. And so uh, these are really models about if you've got different species, can they coexist? But the, the next question is, are the models that we're looking at compatible with uh, models where you are where you have speciation occurring and rare types invading? And, and that, that I don't know. So it, it's possible that you could combine this with, with a sort of speciation process where rare types are able to invade. And then in, in a case where you had sort of temporal movements of, of resources, I think you might, it, it would still be relevant. But definitely at, at the point we're at so far, it's really, you've got this environment, you can get coexistence. Yep. No. <clears throat> when you have coexistence, it's not for really forever, is it? No, it's, I mean, it's definitely not. These are finite populations. Finite populations, so you would expect that eventually one should take over. It might take geological lengths of time. Exactly, for yeah. For some parameter population. Yeah. And I guess the, the other thing I want to raise is, um, having gotten into this situation isn't the stage set for further differentiation of these types. Yeah. <clears throat> so that they could start to become adapted to local conditions if those vary. Absolutely, and I and I think that's a great point. I think that, I mean, I, I would never argue that you could ever have two species that are truly ecologically equivalent. I mean, if, if one is producing a red pigment and one is producing a yellow pigment, then that necessitates that they're somehow using the resources in slightly different ways. So I think that this is not that you, if you have differentiation sexual, in sexually selected traits, you're gonna end up with ecological differentiation. And, but, it could be that the sexual selection creates the initial differences, and then natural selection through, you know, because there are now slightly different ranges, creates other differences that mean that even if the sexually selected traits end up disappearing at some point, they could be maintained through ecological differences. So, but I think that that's the kind of key difference here is that usually people put natural selection as being the kind of primary thing that is led to the, is, is, is maintaining the species. And then once you've got them sort of eating different things, you could have different fishery and runaways that, that lead to different sexually selected traits in different populations. But I think here it, we could say that maybe they, they came back in contact, they were initially being maintained only by sexually selected traits, and then they differentiated in their ecological exploitation. Another thing that seems to be left out of your models, maybe on purpose, is that there's a lot of evidence in the literature that females also uh, often we prefer rare types, and uh, this would work against uh, yeah. the other. Maybe they could have this, the same conflict and the same behavior. Yeah, A any, yeah, exactly. Any of the types of, of models of female preference where where a female prefers just something novel, then of course you'd, you'd end up with rare types invading it, always. Um, but I think that, you know, if you could imagine that you have different populations I mean, I, I kind of think of this as a secondary contact model. You different populations where females in one population prefer rare traits, and, or both populations prefer rare tra traits that happen to sort of run them down different sexually selected trajectories. And then when they come back in contact, it might be that they're so different that what's a rare trait in the, the other species is actually just not even preferred at all. So I think that depending on, you know, as long as they're, I think there are probably ways you could do it, but I, I think you're right that the main thing here that is critical is you have select selection against rare 
Rare types. Yep. Um, what happened? I, you modeled female choosiness. Yep. But what if the males have some level of choosiness? Well, so actually, if you had the males, if you have male choosiness, that would actually probably eliminate the need for female um, cost cost in females because if, if if both females are sort of choosing, then the choice in males creates selection against rare females, and the choice in females could create selection against rare males, and so you could end up with if you had both species sort of preferring their own types that you you might not need costs anymore. But uh, again, if you had males preferring rare females, then you, the whole thing would, would break down again. Well, especially in situations where male display has an impact on female choosiness. If they choose not to display, they're not going to be chosen. Yes. Yep. Uh, so I'm trying to think how this would actually play out, Lathan, and in the context of Seth's question as well. It seems like, at least initially, through this model, you, there's kind of no end to the number of species that, that are ecological equivalents that could co-occur. Right. And then what you're, it seems then that you've, you've got a very kind of non-equilibrial situation. And, but then over time, what you're arguing is that they're either going to displace each other or they're, they're one's going to, well, well, they'll displace each other or di diverge. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's a critical thing to know, really, isn't it, as to how long this lasts in the, in the temporal sense and in the context of the resource, is, if the resource is going to change, and, and what actually happens over the longer term. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Joe's point as well is relevant here that you know, we're not looking at, at evolution actually within populations. And so the, you know, it, there's not necessarily anything maintaining female choosiness. So actually, if you if you were to let female preferences evolve, maybe you would end up with preferences evolving to zero and then the whole thing collapsing again. So I think that um, what this is is kind of a very simple model of you've got these different things, they come back, and look, they can coexist by sexual selection. But the next questions are, how do they get there in the first place? And, and then what happens on an evolutionary time scale next? So if, you know, if you've got temporal fluctuations in the, in the resources and you have um, sexual selection, could you end up with evolution of further stronger preferences or do you end up with lots of preferences? So I think those are great things to hopefully uh, that I'll get to next. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not sure this is right, but in your simulations for the contact zone stuff, did you have the, the females are mating once or mating with one male yeah. per generation? Yeah. So what happens if they mate multiply and have you tried that? So I haven't tried that, but um, there, there are, so in crickets, for example, the females meet multiply, and at least the ones I showed you, and they, they exhibit extremely strong conspecific sperm preference. That's actually what got me interested in this in the first place. So if a female mates with multiple males, and one of those is a heterospecific, or sorry, one of those is a conspecific, that um, female will produce roughly 95% conspecific offspring. So in a situation like that, the the, well, I guess more generally, the, the model here doesn't necessarily have to imply that it's pre-mating choice. It could be a post-mating choice that females are mating randomly, but at the gamete level are, are being selective. Um, yeah, I think that, but I think that that's, I mean, there's a lot of, we actually, in, in the paper, we actually looked at a, a number of different models of female preference, and there are different models of female preference that do not, would not work, and so one of them is, is say, a grouping model where if you have females mate with whatever males are just nearby them, which is still a model of sexual selection, but you know it might be that they, because they're the males around them are not a random subset of the males. But any model like that doesn't create selection against rare males because they're just choosing the males around them. And so those types of models, I think it would be interesting to know, look at, at all those and see what they do. Further questions for Lathan? All right, let's thank him for an interesting talk.